I want to speak to you as God leads me in the hour on the grace of God, the marvel of the grace of God. I marvel at it. My commission, my whole life is given over to telling the story over and over again of the grace of God. Unthinkable, indescribable, untellable is the grace of God. And yet I, I take a stab at it every time I stand at the pulpit to preach. I'm determined to know nothing among you in Christ and crucified. Often I've been tempted to go off uh, on a line of thought, probably tarry too long. And I say to myself, I must get back to Calvary. I dare not I'll go off on any kind of a tangent or any kind of a pet theme. I must hasten back to the cross. And I think you'd be wise to do the same thing. The grace of God, the theme of all of we in this building. And I'm aware of the fact that my tongue is not adequate. My ability is not sufficient. My adjectives cannot describe the grace of God like I'd love to tell it. But I shall try again by the grace of God. To tell the grace of God is like trying to hug a mountain. You never get it done. To tell the grace of God is like trying to describe the loveliness of a sunset to a blind man. You never get that achieved, never get that done. And yet preachers stand and over and over again repeat and attempt to do the impossible and repeat and tell the story of God's amazing grace. Songwriters do the same thing. Uh, years ago, I was preaching at Highland Park with Dr. Lee Robinson at a conference. And I went out of the prophet's chamber to get a noonday meal. And upon returning to the prophet's chamber, I heard music from the inside. And I wondered who was in the, the prophet's room. I thought I had the only key. But I stepped inside the kitchen part of the prophet's chamber and I looked inside the other room. And there at the piano sat Dr. Charles Wango. He's now with the Lord, a gracious man, a good man, famous songwriter. And I, I suppose that he was picking out the melody of a new song. And I dare not disturb him at his task. So I slipped back into the kitchen and sat down. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited. And after a while, I thought that his task was finished for the moment. I got up and walked into the room and greeted Dr. Wango. I'd known him. He'd been at Tabernacle. I said, sir, good to see you. What are you doing? That dear old man, 90 years old at that particular time, died a few years later at the age of 95. But at that time, an aged man with a sparkle in his eye and a spring in his step looked at me and said, I'm writing a new song. And I didn't say to him, but I thought to myself, if I could have written, no one ever kept me like Jesus, I believe I would have retired and never written another. And wrote more than 200 great gospel hymns. And there he is, doing what I'm trying to do now, attempt to tell the grace of God. And I said, Dr. Michael, what's the title of your new song? And he said, Oh, what glory. What about that? Oh, what glory. Some Baptists don't know much about that, you know. But he said, Oh, what glory. And I said, I'm anxious to hear that. He said, I plan to sing it tomorrow morning at the morning service at 10 o'clock in the great oratory at Holland Park. I said, Sir, I'll be there. I want to hear it. And I was there the next morning when he sang publicly for the first time, Oh, what glory. When I looked into his wonderful face, how God blessed that song and people rejoiced and Baptist preachers stood and shouted the praises of God and I marvel at it and I love the song until this day. Now that's an attempt on the part of the songwriter to tell the grace of God. He felt as I feel that we've never been able to successfully uh, do the task and to tell the story like uh, it ought to be told. I've seen the majestic sunset. But nothing is more wonderful than a vision of the grace of God. Uh, the, I've seen the gratitude of young mothers as they rock their, their newborn babes uh, with pride. I've seen the ceaseless waves casting up the mire of the, of the ocean. I've seen the beautiful valleys in their abundance of productivity. I've seen the lofty mountains as they reach up uh, their mountain peaks toward the sky and giving praise to God. I've seen the mighty eagle soar to the air in majestic glory. I've seen the masterpieces of Michelangelo and other great artists of renown. I've seen the uh, mighty giant 747 lift fully loaded off of an airport one way and stand them uh, uh, amazed. I've seen the beautiful lily open its white face toward the morning sun in all of its glory. I've seen the vast fields of the harvest of the corn crop and the wheat crop in the great fields across our land. I've seen the lightning flash across the horizon and heard the mighty thunder roar. I've seen the mighty Mississippi bore its way all the way through the continent of our great and beloved land. 
I've seen the growth and maturity of little ones, children, in our family circle, in our church circle. I've seen the enslaved sinner lifted from the miry clay and a song put upon his lips. I've seen the power of the gospel with all of its miracle working ability to transform a sinner. I've seen the prosperity of the church triumphant in your day and in mine. I've seen the perseverance of embattled pilgrims as we wade through one battle after another and then spring into the fight all over again. I've seen the need of God's people met. I've seen the bereaved saint of God comforted in the grace of God and the love of God. I've seen the shaft of sunlight break through uh, the stormy clouds and bring hope of a better day. I've seen little churches revived by the touch of God's great and mighty hand. I've seen the touch of the mighty hand of God upon a defeated saint of God, and he sprang into the thick of the battle all over again. I've seen the blessing of God upon the tithe of both the individual and the congregation. I've seen the seed of God's Word bring forth fruit unto new birth. But the greatest thing I've ever seen is a marvel of grace working in your life and in my life and in the lives of sinners. Grace unthinkable, grace untellable, grace amazing. The songwriter hit the word correctly when he said, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Grace. Now let me read to you a bit from Second Samuel chapter number 9. And I read in verse 1, and David said, Is there yet any left of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God in him for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Zeba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said, Art thou Zeba? And he answered, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not any left of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Zeba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son who is lame upon his feet, though a prince, yet a cripple. Though the son of a king, yet in need of the grace of God. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba answered the king, Behold, he is in the house of Micah, the son of Abiel, in the land of Lodibar, the land of no bread, the land of want, and the land of spiritual poverty. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Micah, the son of Abiel, from Lodibar. Now when Mosebus said, and I wouldn't guarantee the pronunciation of that name that these Hebrew, Hebrew names sometimes cause us to stumble. Uh, but I think I have the correct pronunciation. Now, when Mofemo said, by the way, I was preaching down in Macon at Makata Baptist Church in a mission conference uh, a good number of years ago, and I was reading the Gospel of Luke, and in my text I was going to come across the word Genesaret. And I had a premonition when I got to that name, I was not going to be able to say that. And sure enough, when I got down to the verse where the word Genesaret is found, I was dead. I, uh, my life had depended upon it. I could not then have said Genesaret. I was embarrassed. And I said to the pastor behind me, say it for me. He said Genesaret. And I went on to read and preach the sermon. But while I was reading and while I was preaching, I said to myself, Luke, why could you not just as well said Galilee instead of Genesaret? And so the name of Pebble said, uh, I, I think I have the correct pronunciation. Now when Pebble said, the lame prince, the son of Jonathan, the grandson of Saul. In the Bible, there are no grandsons. You're the son of Saul and the son of your father and the son of your grandfather. Was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and I am going to restore to thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. There's eternal life, everlasting life that we Baptists believe in. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? What a testimony. A few years ago I preached on the seven most classic statements I find in the Bible. And among those seven statements was the statement of Ruth in chapter 1 of Ruth, Entreat me not to leave thee, nor from father and after thee. Where thou likest, I shall lie. Where thou livest, I shall live. Where thou diest, I will die. Where thou art buried, I will be buried also. Entreat me not to leave thee, nor from father and after thee. I think that's classic. And then I brought a message from my people in that series on the testimony of Esther when she said, If I perish, I perish. What a tremendous testimony. Then another uh, in that sermon, uh, the testimony of young David, is there not a cause? Oh, I'd love to preach on that if I had the time in this meeting. Is there not a cause? And then among the seven is this verse number nine, number eight. What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Then the king said, Zeba, to Saul's uh, servant Zeba, 
I have given unto my master's son all that pertained to Saul and all of his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruit, that thy master's son may have food to eat. But the fellow said, Shall eat bread always at my table. There is eternal life again. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, All that my lord the king hath commanded his servant to do, so shall thy servant do. As for the fellow said, He shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. So there's the story. I want to say four things about the grace of God to you in this hour. Number one, grace is God loving, unlovely sinners. Number two, grace is God giving Jesus to die upon the cross for ungodly sinners. Number three, grace is God lifting out that which cannot lift out itself. And number four, grace illustrated by the story that I read from Second Samuel chapter number nine. Number one, grace is God loving the unlovely. Here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us. For God so loved the world of sinners that he gave his only begotten Son. Oh, love of God that wins my soul and will not let me go. Grace is God loving unlovely sinners. Now I'll be able to understand how God can love some people. There are good people in this building, good, relatively speaking. You're honest, you're moral, you're upright. I marvel at you. Thank God for you. I may be able to understand how God could love a good, clean young man, a dedicated, clean, nice uh, young woman. I can fathom that. I think I can understand how God could love a good, honest, hardworking man that loves his family, loves God, loves his church, you see. I might fathom that, but when I know that the grace of God is infinitely greater than that, when I recognize that the bum and the destitute, the reprobate, the drunkard, the harlot, the doper, the prostitute, all are included in the scope of God's love that I stand off to the amazed. There is not one person in all the city of Charlotte for whom Christ did not die. There is not one sinner in your city that Jesus does not love and would not welcome with outstretched arms to come and receive the gift of eternal and everlasting life. For God so loved the world of sinners that he gave. Grace is God loving not good people, but bad people. And to tell you the truth about it, we're all bad people. I've never gotten to the place that I thought that I was good. I certainly don't deserve any such recognition. I'm not good except in the grace of God. I'm so glad that where sin abounds, grace doth much more abound. And I can say with Paul, I am what I am by the grace of God and only by the grace of God. Grace is God loving, unlovely sinners. A few months ago, a few years ago now, I received a letter from a woman in Greensboro, North Carolina. And the letter started and read something like this. I'm 55 years old. I, I'm, uh, I've, I've been married three times and divorced. I've had six children. Three of them died in infancy because of a social disease in my body. I, she said, I'm a drunkard. I'm a doper. She said, I'm the most vile, dirty woman in all the city of Greensboro, North Carolina. And she said, I just need to write to you. I didn't want you to handle the paper that I had to handle to write this letter to you. I'm so dirty, so vile, so ungodly. But she said, I've been hearing you preach on the radio, and I want to know if God would save a sinner like me. And I stopped everything and sat down at my time right with tears in my eyes, and I wrote a bike, and I said, there's a bomb in Gilead. There's a sympathizing Savior. I said, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And I put all those good promises in a letter and sent them back to that woman in Greensboro. And you know, she got converted. I mean, saved. I mean, born again. <laughs> the good old-fashioned kind of being born again. Right, you got born again. And wrote me and gave me a testimony of a grace and a faith. And let me give you a climax that God miraculously gave to me, uh, to that story. A few months later, six months later, I was in Greensboro at a meeting. The pastor said he'd meet me at the cafeteria at 12 noon on Saturday. We'll have fellowship together. We'll have dinner together. I met him at 12 noon at the cafeteria on Saturday, downtown in Greensboro. We went through the line. And going through the line, I told the pastor about the woman who'd gotten converted there in Greensboro with the idea of maybe he could baptize her, I thought. And I told him the story just as I told it to you, except maybe in more detail and while we were getting our food together. And then when we finished the story, when I finished the story, I discovered that I couldn't remember the woman's name. 
Of course, you don't have that problem, but you're not quite as old as I am. One day, you'll have that problem, as I had it. And I could not at that moment think of the woman's name. I should have remembered it, but I couldn't think of it to save my life. And I apologized to my pastor friend and said, when I get home, I'll check the files, I'll send it to you through the mail, and you can visit the woman. Maybe you can baptize her. I'd like to have done that. I sure would love to have done that. But maybe you can baptize her. And we sat down just about ready to grace our food and enjoy our fellowship and food. And a young girl about ten years from my old, whom I'd never seen before or since, in fact, walked up to me and handed me an envelope. And she said, does this envelope belong to you? And I looked on the outside and said, the bride's for our was on this box four in Greenville, South Carolina. I said, yes, ma'am, that belongs to the radio. Where'd you get this? And she said, my mother saw you come in to the cafeteria, and she thinks you're the preacher she's been hearing over the radio. And she said, if he's the preacher, just give him the letter, and we'll not have to mail it. And I thanked that little girl as she turned and walked away. And I was about to slip the letter in my pocket, and I looked on the back of it. Automatically, I guess, and believe it or not, there was that woman's name. I couldn't think of it a moment ago. There's the woman's name. And I said, Pastor, here's a miracle. A woman who I've never met, never seen, and written to. I said, here she is free. And it was away from it. And I left my pastor and left my food, and I went over and sat down with that woman. My wretched soul describes herself to me in the letter. And she began to talk about how good it was to be saved. And great big tears began to run down her cheeks, you know. And her lips quivered and sit and cried and rejoiced. It was the only people in the world that can cry and laugh at the same time as same people. And she said, they're weeping for joy. And I got happy on the other side of the table. I said, they're laughed in the spirit. I was just having your time. One side of the table laughing, the other side weeping. I don't know what people thought, but we had us a camp meeting. Rejoicing over what grace did to that rich woman. Now, grace can do that. Grace can do that. Two years after that, God gave another climax to that story. I preached one Sunday morning to the tabernacle, and a lady came forward and said, Do you know me? After the service was over, Do you know me? I said, Ma'am, I should, but I'm sorry I couldn't call your name. I'm sorry. Then she said, You remember the lady in Greensboro? And then in a moment, it all came back to me. She was then uh, about several years older, of course, gray and wrinkled and a bit feeble. And she said, I drove the 200 miles today to tell you that it's still good. And we had another shout as well right there in the church. Amen. Grace is God loving, unlovely son. Grace can save the wretched, the vilest of the vile. There's none beyond the scope of God's grace. 25, 20, hit yourself, young fella. Maybe you'll just have us a shout time here today. I'd rather have a shout than to have clout. Amen. I had I baptized a woman at the tabernacle and somebody came to me and said, Preacher, you know who you baptized? And I said, I think so. Oh, you don't understand. They said, You just baptized one of the most popular harlots Greenville ever had. I said, Glory to God. Hallelujah. Twenty five years ago I baptized that harlot woman. Her, her beauty was then faded. Now she's old and feeble and can hardly walk. But she comes to church when she's able, and she goes right back to the choir where she's been singing for 25 years. And nobody in the church knows who that woman is but me. I've never told my wife. She's heard me tell that story, but I wouldn't tell her name to anybody in that church, including my wife. And she sits there in the choir and sings, Oh, how I love Jesus. And when I see her, I say, Lord, save a hundred harlots in Greenville. All of them in the choir. Grace is God loving, unlovely sinners. Grace. But nor is grace God loving, but grace is God giving. Grace is God giving. Here is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and came. He came in His only begotten Son. I'm glad for that. Without Calvary, our Bible is void, empty, and meaningless. Without the cross, my faith is nothing. Without the cross, I have no foundation. Without the cross, I have no hope. But I'm glad that there was a dispensation, Paul speaks of, that he called the dispensation of the grace of God, at which time the Christ of glory, God's holy, eternal, ever born Son of God, laid aside the glory that he had with God the Father and came down into this earth and died 
a vicarious death upon an old rugged cross to lift me out of my sin and lift you out of your sin. Grace is God given. Tis done. The great transaction is done. The door stands wide open. There is nothing that would keep any sinner from receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. Therefore, O oh man, thou art without excuse. The price is paid. But it's not how vile your sin may be. The price is paid. But it's not how old you may be. The price is paid. Right. You can be saved. That's grace God give in. I wonder if the pastor of this church or pastor of Brother Robinson of the gospel, I suppose Brother Barbie would have come down with kidney failure. He has a great church. I've been in that church many times. They have good people, good men. If Brother Robert Robinson were to come down with kidney failure, I dare say one of those men, maybe his fine son who's his sister there at the church, would step forward and say, Now, I'll donate one of my kidneys that my pastor could live. And I'd understand that. I'd marvel at it, but I could understand that because they love their pastor, and I'm sure Steve loves his daddy. And he'd, he'd give his kidney in a moment. If that would add two years to Brother Robert Robinson's life, I pray, of course, that would never happen. But I can understand that. I can understand that. But how about that harlot woman? Suppose her kidney fails. Where is the one that will step forward and say, I'll give a kidney to the harlot? Uh, how about the wino? Where is the man that will step forward and say to the wino, you can have my kidney. Your kidney is a failure. You can have mine. No, you don't do that. The wino has to die. And the harlot has to die. Nobody loves them that much. I can understand. Died for the wino. And Christ died for the harlot. And Christ died for the sinner. You don't have to be good to qualify. You have to be mad to qualify. And if you're mad, you qualify. Come and receive eternal and everlasting life. Grace is God giving. And then number three, grace is God lifting that which God lifted sin. Have you ever watched the spider weave a web? And you wonder why the spider weaves the web? There he moves back and forth across those silken cords with the greatest of ease. Does he build that web as a garment to clothe his body? Not the answer. Does he build that web to demonstrate his ability to do something that human hands cannot duplicate? That isn't the answer. Does he build that web as a thing of beauty and is a thing of beauty and precision? That's not the answer. He builds the web for one reason, a snare, a trap. Mr. Spider knows that soon Mr. Fly is coming by and he's going to see that beautiful web and he's going to light on that web and marvel at its precision and beauty. And in a moment he's, saying, I'm, he's going to say, I'm, I shall fly away. And when he attempts to fly away, he then discovers his legs are hopelessly ensnared in those silken cords. And he's going to turn them, trying to liberate himself. But the more he tries to liberate himself, the more ensnared he becomes. And after a while, the uh, fly lays over exhausted and the spider moves across the web to devour the prey. Now, you might have watched that drama and reached down and picked the fly up out of pity for an instinct. And let him fly away. And he flew away as if to say, thank you, mister. You lifted me out just at the moment of time. Now, there was a day when you were ensnared by the spider web of sin. And you tried to liberate yourself by good works, or by reformation, or by resolutions, or by human resolve. Nothing worked. The more you tried to liberate yourself, the more ensnared you became. Then one day... God reached this great everlasting arm deep down into the miry clay and lifted you up and turned you loose. And here you are today, rejoicing in grace because you've been lifted out of the miry clay. What a wonderful thing it is to be lifted out. He lifted me out from a horrible pit. He set my feet upon a solid rock. I glory in Christ. I live and move and have my being in Christ. Now, number four, grace illustrated by the story that I read to you a moment ago. I'd like to turn the curtains of some centuries back in your mind, and let's go back to visit in the palace of King David. David, who founded the city of Jerusalem, built first his own palace. And we'll go into that palace, into the throne room, and visit for a moment. I see the throne room, and here's the throne upon which the day, uh, David, the king, occupies. Then I see about him the servants of his household. And among the servants of his household is one called Ziba, who in the story is a type of the blessed Holy Spirit of God. And David said, Ziba, is my project over? 
Is there any lamp that hasn't yet been brought in that may show the kindness of God to them? For Jonathan's sake, and I want to say to you, my friend, that whatever goodness you enjoy, it's because of Jesus. For Jesus' sake. God loves you for Jesus' sake. God saved you for Jesus' sake. As he was just about ready to say, Your Majesty, you've been wonderful. We admire you. All your people admire you. Uh, you sought from Dan to Bathsheba. You found every single descendant of Saul, your bitter enemy, who attempted to take your life several times, and you brought them in and shown the kindness of God to every one of them. And we all are so appreciate you. Just about ready to say, Your project is over. When God says, Eva, there's one that hadn't been brought in. I imagine there might have been some wrestling in the mind of Ziba. At that point, he might have said, Now, Lord, I'll, I'll not bother King David about that paralytic down there in Lodibar. I know him. I'll visit him for the king. I'll do something good for the king. I'll just not bother his majesty with that nobody. God said, You tell David his project is over. It's not you lie. You tell him the truth. And so Ziba had no choice. He said, Your majesty, we marvel at you. We thank God for you. But there's one yet that has not been brought in. And all the world's filled up with one yet. And that's the thrust of Brother uh, Buffington's message a moment ago. There's one yet. You're not going to win them all, but you'll get one. You may not get as many as you'd like to get, but you'll get one. The devil has told me a thousand times plus, you're washed up, you're finished. You're baptized no more. Forget it. Close your baptist up and forget it. He's told me that a many a time. But when baptized at night comes around, we usually have. Not as many as we'd love to have. We've never had as many as we'd love to have. But we usually have one. Amen. We usually have one. There's one that'll hear you. Keep preaching the gospel. You dare not preach politics. You dare not preach, uh, preach the Democratic Party or the Democratic nominee. You dare not preach civil rights. You dare not begin, again to preach social gospel. Stay with the gospel. Yeah. At least God will stay with you if the crowds leave you. God will stay with you. Yeah. Don't you ever get away from the gospel. I was driving home one night. I'll get back to David in a moment. And... Uh, God said, uh, in the morning, I want you to preach on John 3.16. And I said, now, Lord, I ought to have my sermon ready. Thank you. And I'll just preach my sermon. And I kept going down 85. And down the road, about 100 miles, God nudged again and said, in the morning, John 3.16. I said, now, Lord, I've, I've got a sermon. I, I hate to preach on John 3.16 tomorrow. I plowed through that verse all my life, and I'm an old preacher let the young man preach that, Lord. Let, let these young fellows, they can handle that just as good as I can. Let me preach my son. And I thought I had God persuaded. But a hundred miles, 95, urged me again, John 3, 16, preacher. Tomorrow morning. I said, okay, Lord, if that's what you want, it'll be John 3, 16. And the next morning I opened to that beloved verse of Scripture and preached on it and heaven came down. God warmed my old cold heart. And I got all excited. I don't ever get to where I don't get excited when I preach. The trouble soon you preach is now you're dead. You ought to get a little fire under your, your bone. Get, get some enthusiasm. You, you, you get all excited about the Atlanta, Atlanta Braves. Why can't you get excited about Peter, Paul, and John? Right. And I said, now, Lord, uh, I'm acting like a novice. I got excited. I got the shouting in my pulpit. What about that? Sunday morning. Got all excited. They preached loud. Preached loud. What about that? And I thought to myself, Lord, an old man like me got no business preaching like this. But when I finished, I said, any time, oh, any time. <laughs> if I thought I'd get another blessing, I'd preach on John 3, 16, Monday, Sunday. Oh, my. And uh, Stephen said, there's one that hadn't been brought in, David. David said, who is he? The fellow said, where is he? He's in the house of Macon, the son of Emiel, in the land of Lodibar. David said, go fetch him. Now, that's beneath the dignity of you sophisticated Baptists. Go fetch him. My old grandmama used to say, fetch. Fetch me this. And I thought to myself, grandmama hadn't been to high school. But uh, when I found it in the Bible, I found where grandmama got it. I hadn't bowed through the Bible much as Grandmama did. 
And you want to say, Fetch, you help yourself, will you? You help yourself. David said, Go back him. Bring him to me. David said, Yes, Your Majesty. And then David, I imagine, hits the best horses he had to his own personal chariot. And in a moment, the chariot driver is waiting for Ziva in front of the palace. And Ziva steps on board, and the driver says, Where? To, sir. He said, The land of Lodibar, the house of Mecca, the son of Abiel. Uh, wait a minute, Ziva. You've got your signals crossed. You mean you carried the king's chariot down into that God forsaken Southland? Why, you're mistaken. You've got your. Uh, you heard me. Lodibar. Let's be going. And that driver pulls the trains and turns to leave David's palace through the winding streets and out of the gates of the ancient city down toward the south land, Lodibar. Further and further in that god forsaken area. Poor people looked out and saw the king's chariot and said, Why? What does this mean, the king's chariot in Lodibar? And on and on, after a while, that chariot stopped in front of the most humble house in the community. I heard a preacher say the other day, We're going out after the executives. We're going to get all the big fellows in Greenville in our church. Now, while he was talking, I didn't say anything, but I thought to myself, Lord, just give me the sinners. If the executive wants to come, have him step. But I'd as soon sit next to a man saved by grace if he's a former criminal. Right. Don't make a bit of difference to me. When what God makes clean, don't let a man call unclean. The tabernacle is a house full of sinners. From the pulpit throughout, we're all sinners, but we're saved sinners, praise God. And uh, he stepped off board that chariot, walked across an unkept yard, knocked on a door that hangs maybe from one hinge, and I can hear the knock in my mind. And from the inside comes the weak, feeble voice of the sick paralytic. Come in. Ziva pushed that door open, stepped inside an unkept, unclean, sick room, shuttered room, and in the corner a bed and a poor, helpless, young paralytic, maybe 25, 30 years old, just a young fellow, never walked a step in his life. The paralyses had uh, taken such a toll until he was wasted, until he was nothing. How did that happen? Well, if you read three chapters earlier in the same book, you'll find the Philistines coming against uh, Saul and his palace, and the nursemaid picked up that lad and rushed out of the palace in her haste. She fell on the stone cobble walkway and dropped that lad, fractured his skull, his arms, and as a result of the fall, you see the typology? As a result of the fall, he became a hopeless paralytic. As a result of Adam's sin, I am what I am. But I'm glad I know the second man, Adam, who is Jesus, our Lord. And that boy had never walked a step. He didn't play ball when he was a lad. He couldn't. He was paralyzed. And it's getting worse and worse until now. He's a miserable mess right at the point of death. And Ziba steps over and says, Mephibosheth? Yes, sir. Are you the son of Jonathan, the grandson of King Saul? Yes, sir. Well, I'm Ziba, the servant of his majesty, King David. And I've been sent to fetch you to King David. Not me, sir. Look, look at my hand. I... I couldn't serve the king's tables. And look at my feet. I'd not be able to march in the king's army. You're not looking for me, sir. Now, he doesn't need me. No. Your name is Mephibosheth? Yes, sir, that's my name. Well, I've been sent to bring you just as you are without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. O Lamb of God, I come, I come. I'm glad that's so, aren't you? If I had to have a thousand dollars, I'd be disqualified. If I had to have a college education, I may be disqualified. I had to be popular, I might be disqualified. I had to be renowned, I might be disqualified. But there's nobody disqualified. We've been sent to fetch you just like you are. And that traveler picks up that man like a mother and pick up a baby. Bears him out of that hovel in Lodibar, puts him into that chariot. Lodibar means the land of no bread. And that, that's the end of all sinners. The land of no bread, the land of no hope and lays him down in the bed of that chariot. And he steps aboard and takes up the reins. And then Ziva steps aboard. And they start that precious trip back to King David. I preached this sermon one time at Tabernacle. Don't tell this on me, please. But I was preaching on Mephibosheth one night at Tabernacle. And I got the, the Mephibosheth in the chariot. Got it turned around, but I bogged down. And I couldn't move that chariot. I shouted 50 minutes. And then I said, now, Lord, I've got to get this sermon finished. Let me move this chariot. And I tried to move it the second time and bogged down again. 
And we shouted another ten minutes. I said, Lord, I've got to get this thing home and finish the sermon. And I tried the third time and bogged down the third time, and I closed my book, and we shouted for thirty minutes. <laughs> now, if you tell that on me, it might hurt an old preacher in his old age, so don't tell anybody about that. But it sure happened. Some of my people here today, and they know what happened. They were there when it happened. What a blessed story. They turned it around. Oh, happy day, oh, happy day. When God sent His blessed Holy Ghost and found me in the land of Lodibar, picked me up in the arms of mercy and put me down in the chair of grace, started me back to the king. Immortal. King of kings. Lord of Lord. And they made the way back to the palace. Amen. And when they arrived back at King David's palace, they picked him up and bear him inside. Lay him down at the feet of the king, and all the servants stand about at attention. And after a while, David breaks the silence, and he gets up and says, The fellow said, And I think when that poor paralytic heard his name called from the lip of royalty, it was like a mother's lullaby. She rocks a fevered baby at the midnight hour. It was like a letter from home, good news from home. How it stilled the storm in the heart of Mephibosheth. He might have thought, he's brought me here to execute judgment, take revenge, because my granddaddy tried to kill him. He's going to take my life. But when he heard the king say, and then David said a second word. He said, fear not, don't be afraid. And I think when that poor paralytic heard his name called from the lip of royalty, it was like a mother's lullaby. She rocks a fevered baby at the midnight hour. It was like a letter from home, good news from home. How it stilled the storm in the heart of Mephibosheth. He might have thought, he's brought me here to execute judgment, take revenge, because my granddaddy tried to kill him. He's going to take my life. But when he heard the king say Mephibosheth, all his fears took wings and flew away. I'm not making any promises, but when I get to heaven and I'm going, I have a new name written down that nobody knows. And when Jesus calls that name, I'm not making you any promises. I think I'm going to shout. I really do. But Femmo said, and then David said a second word. He said, fear not, don't be afraid. Jelai brought you here to imprison you, but I brought you here to show the kindness of God to you for Jonathan's sake. And that's more than this boy could understand. He, I would imagine tears begin to trickle down his, uh, his uh, initiated face. He's brought me here to show kindness to me. And my granddad tried to kill him. And then he remembered my daddy was his friend. And because of his sake, he's going to be kind to me. And then Mephibosheth answered back with that immortal verse number 8. What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Now I want to put myself right there. I'm a dead dog. As far as I'm concerned, there's not that much righteousness in me. I'm a dead dog. I ought to go to hell. There's nothing good in me. But I'm glad that I've been found and redeemed and saved by God. And God lifted out a dead dog and put hope in my soul and glory in my heart and a foundation under my feet. And don't get offended at me. Don't get mad at me. But we're a congregation of dead dogs. The last one of you shouting, boys, are dead dogs. You're not shouting because you think you're anything. You're shouting because you know you're nothing. And yet in Jesus, you found some victory. And that's the reason to sing and preach and testify and shout. Why would you look upon such a dead dog as I am? God bless you, old brother. That's a Tennessee man I preach to in Johnson City. I believe he's got good religion. I know him. He's all right. Thank you, yourself, brother. God bless you. Amen. And then they step back. And David says to a servant, I want you to fix the east room tonight. We have a guest. And that servant, I'll read it between the lines at that point. That servant I said now, David, that's where the kings live. But the uh, uh, abide. But the second glance of David gets the answer. And that night they fixed the king's room, the queen's room, the east room, not for a king, but for a dead dog. In my father's house of many mansions. And those mansions are prepared for dead dogs who get saved by grace. Amen. 
Then David said, I want you to fix the east room. I want you to fix the plate at my table. Because we have a guest for supper tonight. And I met that service said, David, look at that, brother. He can't handle a knife and fork. He'll be a source of embarrassment. Do you and all your family? He can't do that. But they fixed the king's table for a dead dog. And one day God's going to stretch the table from sky to sky and go. And me and you dead dogs are going to sit down with Abraham and Peter and Sam. Amen! And James and John are on the way table at the sky. And then David said, Zima, go down to the recorder's court in the morning and tell the recorder, and this is not between the lines. Tell the recorder, I want every foot of land, every acre of the soil I've owned. I want it deeded to Mephibosheth. And then I want you to take your 15 sons and 20 servants and plow it and plant it and harvest it. But don't put it in your barn, put it in his barn. What about that? And Mephibosheth has a listener to all of that. In a moment, he's transformed from Lodibar to riches and glory. He spent one night in Lodibar, the next night in the king's house. I imagine I slip over to Mephibosheth and say, Mephibosheth, what did you do to cause David to do so much for you? And I think if I could ask him, he'd say, In my hand no prize do I bring, but sent to thy cross I claim. And he'd say, He did it all! He did it all! He did it all! And I want to say to you today, Jesus did it all! I'm a part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Ghost power. The die has been cast. I've stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I'm a disciple of His. I won't look back. I won't let up. I won't slow down. I won't back away. I won't be still. My past is redeemed and my present makes sense and my future is secure. I'm finished and done with low living and sidewalking and small planning and smooth knees and colorless dreams and tame visions and dropped goals. I no longer need preeminence. I no longer need prosperity. I no longer need position. I no longer need promotion or popularity. I don't have to be right. I don't have to be first. I don't have to be on top. I don't have to be recognized. I don't have to be praised. I don't have to be regarded nor rewarded. I now live by presence, lean by faith, walk by patience, lift by prayer, and labor by power. My face is set. My gatch is fast. My goal is heaven. My road is narrow. My way is rough. And my companions few. My guide reliable. My mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, looted away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, nor hesitate in the presence of adversity, nor negotiate at the table of the enemy, nor ponder in the pool of popularity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I'm stayed up and torn up and prayed up and paid up and preached up for the cause of Christ. I'm a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes. Give till I drop. Preach till all know. Work till he stops me. And when he comes in his all for his own, he will have no problem recognizing me. My colors are clear. Yeah.